Yes, a very good evening to you tuned into UBC TV. We welcome you to UBC One on One with Michael Jordan Lokomwa. And this evening, we are paying a visit to the oldest, biggest university in the country, and that's none other than Makere University, Kampala. We are at the hill, and we want to know a number of things. They are opening again after a long period without classes, and how are they opening? What changes has that come with? Plus a number of issues that are here at the hill. I'm going to talk to the man himself, the Vice Chancellor, Makere University, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe. We have him. Professor, we are so grateful to have you on the show. You're most welcome. Thank you and a good evening, viewers. Yes. How is the situation like that you are opening? In fact, let me start with this. How would you describe the long period of the lockdown? How has it treated you as Makere? Uh, where well, the long lockdown has affected many people and many sectors, and the Makere is not unique, uh, it has definitely disrupted our programs. We have lost a bit of time because of the disruptions. In the total, I think we have lost six months uh, from our calendar, uh, which, is not, which is not so bad because there are universities that actually have suffered more than that. And the, I think the biggest uh, effect is on our students who have had to stay home for all this time and the studying from home, which is quite different from when they study physically here. The good thing is that they have been studying, yes. but definitely it has had the, an effect of disrupting our programs and delaying whatever we are doing. But we are recovering. For the first time when there was a lockdown, how did you do exams? and again had people graduate at different levels? The good thing is that the first lockdown happened when our students had done most of the learning. And they were only remaining with about four weeks to the examinations. So uh, that was to our advantage. And what happened when we were given that small window for students to come on campus, we utilized it for them to complete whatever they had not done and the, also to see to examinations. And the, that's how we managed to graduate them at that time. Although it was a little bit uh, uh, belated as uh, compared to the normal program. But that's how we managed. Uh, we, we had already, of course, started the teaching them online, but that window uh, enabled us for them to come back and do practicals and such things. Okay. How about things like research? These people that had to do uh, distant research uh, for their uh, dissertations and things like that. Uh, people at master's level, PhD, that were doing a number of things. How were they affected and how did you handle a situation like that? Research also uh, suffered a little, but not as much as teaching because uh, Research largely is an individual undertaking, maybe with a supervisor somewhere. So it is different from uh, teaching where you need, where you get large numbers of people congregating. Uh, with research, it is really uh, normally one or two people or three people maximum. And so uh, we were able to continue with research and including research by graduate students. So the graduate students didn't really suffer as much as the undergraduate students, because they continued doing their research even in the, in the midst of those difficulties. But of course there is a research that could not also take place, especially when we had closed all the facilities, so the labs were closed, and the, that kind of research suffered for some time. But eventually we got permission from the National Council for Higher Education to allow just a few people to make sure that that research is not completely lost. So research suffered a, a bit, but not as much as the teaching. Those classes at different levels that we were holding, people had to pay. These people whose parents were at work not working, or if working, how working halfway, not earning the normal way. How did you manage uh, to have the payments remitted by students, and what measure did you use to ensure that everybody pays what they have to pay? Well, uh, it is uh, unfortunate that this came and disrupted 
all activities, including economic activities, and indeed it affected the capacity for parents to pay. But uh, what we do costs money. And so people had to and they have to pay fees before we can provide the service. Uh, as I said the last time, uh, by the time of the previous lockdown, the majority of students had already paid all their fees. So that was not a big issue. However, now for this uh, particular academic year, that's when people have really been in the pandemic and the ITC uh, implications all the time. Uh, but yeah, I think parents have prioritized the education of their children. In the middle of all those difficulties, they have had to look for the money to pay. I think the good thing, well, not good, but uh, uh, because they did not have to pay at very short notices, like in during the normal times, uh, they had the time to try to collect the money. So they collected the money over a longer period of time, and uh, they are actually paying fees. Okay. Yeah. You talked of e-learning. How did you adopt to wait when the situation dictated? We were lucky in that sense <laughs> because uh, we started the distance education in the late 90s. So for us it was not uh, something new. Although at that time we were not using e-learning, we were using, it was just distance education, sending notes to people by post and uh, things like that and then the students just come to what we used to call face to face. So with that experience it was easy for us to transform uh, into the e-learning uh, mode. Uh, and because the university had already taken, uh, had already approved the policy on e-learning, or what we call uh, <coughs> uh, open distance and e-learning, yes. uh, we had already taken it. By the time COVID came, as Makere, you had already taken up that state. Exactly. And the several programs were already working in the e-learning mode anyway. Uh, and uh, it was a program where we expected the whole university to transform. So, so for several reasons, in order to free some time for people to do research, for the lecturers, but also to increase access uh, because uh, there is a large number of people who want to come to study at Makere, but we cannot admit all of them physically here. So that was the intention. Uh, so we had already developed capacity. We had even introduced what we call the Institute for Open Distance and E-Learning, a fully dedicated institute just to facilitate the e-learning. And so when COVID struck, it just uh, triggered our senses to say, no, we need now to do this thing. So we were not completely unprepared. But of course, it uh, meant that we had to do certain things in a very short time, which we... Exactly, which we should have done over several years, but which, where, where there was no hurry because there was no crisis. What adjustments would you make, if you, you can share briefly, what adjustments did you make to ensure uh, you would accommodate e-learning that came, uh, came beyond your plan, before your plan matured, and it had to affect classes and sharing of knowledge? We simply had to expedite the things we should have been doing. One of them was training our staff on how to conduct uh, lessons through uh, the internet, through e-learning. So we embarked on a massive staff training program, which lasted about two to three months. And we trained over 700 of our staff in that short time on online teaching. And uh, also we negotiated with the service providers to zero rate our websites where we use, where materials for e-learning are so that students don't have to pay when they access these websites. So these, those two <coughs> helped us to make sure that we can actually uh, now begin the, the e-learning. We also had to upgrade our systems. The, 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 the e-learning platform here, which we call Mwele, we had to upgrade it with the new servers and so on. And the, those interventions enabled us to start. As a senior educationist, because as a country we want to take in, COVID has opened up the eyes of the world that e-learning becomes almost the order of the day. 
how far do you think it can go in the education system, especially at, at our home here in Uganda? Well, uh, I think e-learning is already a normal thing around the world. Yes. Especially, especially in the developed world. Personally, I think it is even more important for us. Because for us, our population is growing fast. The populations in the developed world are either stagnant or they are going down. So there is actually even you no know, much pressure on their institutions. For us, there is the enormous pressure on our institutions. And that pressure is going to increase with the years because the, the young people, the number, are, are now reaching the age when they need to come to university. And that is going to be a big problem if we do not adopt e-learning. A lot of the programs will have to be partially done on e-learning if we are to be able to absorb the large numbers of people who will be coming seeking for a higher education. So it is much more important for us. So we cannot say because we are not developed, we have these problems and so on. Those problems will always be there. But we must just take a decision and say we are going to do this. And once we begin doing it, even with the, our rudimentary facilities, it is only through beginning that we will improve those facilities. As Makerere University? Yes. How far do you think e-learning, how far do you think you can take e-learning? Well, I think we have already demonstrated that we are fully prepared for e-learning now. We actually even did the examinations online, which we, all of us thought, oh, is it possible? But we said, let's do it. And we did it. You trained the lecturers. Yes. How easy was it for my brothers and sisters, the students, to get on board? The With the different <laughs> dynamics of our lives. Some had gone back to their homes deep in the villages where there is no electricity, access to a computer. How did they get on board, first of all, so psychologically and even physically, to be part of the system? It was a problem at the beginning. I was getting a lot of uh, messages, you know, students know my <laughs> telephone number. So they were sending WhatsApps, they were sending me emails, saying, you know, for us, we are deep in the village, we don't have internet. We don't. But we said, no, but we don't have an alternative. Find ways of uh, accessing what we are doing. And I want to say I admire the students because they adopted. I think what most of them did was now to move nearer to the towns where internet was accessible. And the, the number of complaints reduced drastically. When we did the, the exams last time, there was no difference between when we have the physical classes during the ordinary times. The number of students who turned up for exams was just about the same. And so uh, I think our people have that uh, capacity to, to adapt very quickly and also it showed us that our people are hungry for their education. They will do everything to get that education. Technically, how was it, I'm imagining, for those of us who studied some time back, yes. an examination calls for supervision, practically when it's being done, then marking. How was that done? Those examinations that need a lot of writing, I'm imagining how this was on an e-system, on an e-arrangement. It was not fully e-examination. Okay. We adopted what we called alternative assessment methods. So different methods were, were used, including e-assessment, uh, where it was uh, possible and where it was the best method. But we used different methods. And uh, uh, our staff are very innovative because uh, we discussed this uh, in the colleges, we encouraged colleges to adopt what they thought was the best way to assess the students to ensure that we maintain quality of what we are doing. And so we used different methods of assessment and I, I think we succeeded. Here you are, they opened first November, you came back to classes, to office and all that. How prepared were you as a university? Uh, for the reopening? Yes. No, we are always ready. We are always prepared to receive students. And uh, remember that the students have been studying. We have been closed physically, but open virtually. 
So the students have continued studying and we have continued doing the same things that we would have done when we are uh, physically open. So the permission for us to physically open uh, just enabled us to make sure that uh, the students could uh, undergo those, uh, that training which we, the, the we ordinary would not undergo uh, virtually, things like practical training or field work. Those now they have to do when they are here. So uh, we did not uh, find any problem that, you know, because we have been closed, there are challenges. No. Uh, the students just came back and we continued. Yeah, them. but this is a period of almost two years without uh, with uh, physical classes being interfered with. Definitely I would expect that when students are coming back physically at once, there would be some preparations. No, the, 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 there was preparation, of course, to make. The, 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 but remember, the students have been studying. So they are not coming to begin from where they are not studying. When they come, the lecturer will just take on from where they stopped, now physically in the classroom, what they had already started online. And uh, remember that we are receiving the students in a staggered manner. We are not receiving all of them at a go. Yes, you, you were physically ordered to open, allowed to open uh, on the 1st of November. But how are you opening? What, how are you going to operate? Yes, uh, in order to observe the standard operating procedures and in order to, uh, to ensure the safety of our students and our staff, uh, especially in order to avoid the spread of COVID-19, we have had to receive the students back in a staggered manner so that we do not have large numbers of students at, on campus at the same time. And so what we have done is uh, we have received all the graduate students, uh, then all the final, final year students and all first year students who will be here until 27th uh, November. They will study, sit the examinations and go away. Except the first years who will just be here to study. They will not sit examinations yet. The first years will go away and they come back uh, to sit examinations. When the continuing students are coming back to sit examinations. Meanwhile, when they go away on 27th, they will go back and continue studying online. Now, on uh, 27th November, we will now receive the rest of the students. The continuing students, all the continuing students. Will, uh, so that means second years and all the other continuing students will come back on on 27th, they will study for uh, roughly one month. On 24th, they will go away for a short holiday and return on 3rd January to begin examinations together with the first years who will have gone away. So that's the way we are, we are managing. So first years are going to be here for only two, three? One month. One month? Yes. Okay. They are going to be here for, but when you say for only, you know, people have been asking me, but the students are going to study only two weeks. No, the students have been studying for three months, only that they have been studying online. So the first years are going to be here. They have been studying online for two months already. They'll study for an extra month here, and then just wait for the exam. And continue again online for another extra month, so they will be studying in a total of four months. So basically, they don't lose any time, because that's the period we... We, our semester takes. What changes are coming with this post-COVID period that we are going for in the education system, especially here at Makerere? The I think what, what this is going to help us is to actually now implement a strategy that we adopted a very long time ago, but which we have not been implementing, what we call uh, learner-centered pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Learner-centered pedagogy means the lecturer facilitates the learners through discussion and so on, but the real learning is by the learner, okay? So the learner does research, basically, and then it comes to class to discuss, and the lecturer facilitates that discussion instead of just reading lectures all the time, but having real interaction during that, uh, that time. So this is going to facilitate that because now our lecturers have been uh, uh, empowered 
uh, with the capacity to conduct uh, these uh, lessons on online, it means they can uh, do that, send out materials and what have you for students to prepare themselves, and then they come to class just to discuss for not necessarily three hours of lecture, but really to have a discussion on the issues that the lecturer will have addressed. So that is going to, to change. The, the mode of, of, of delivery is definitely going to change. What else? Uh, the other thing is that uh, we will now be able to implement what we thought we should implement in 2015. That we can now run several programs online. So instead of having large numbers of students here physically, you can have the same program running but with the students learning at a distance online. Yes. Are we having any changes to do with tuitions and payments? The issue of fees is a debate around the world. There are people who, who think that fees should go down because the students are not around. There are others who say fees must go up. What do you think? The fees ordinarily should go up because we are now going to spend much more money investing in systems to support e-learning. Professor, what do you think about the other side? of how the economic activities have been affected. The theory you said first. Yes, uh, well, wh what I said is uh, uh, activities have been affected and uh, uh, because of the delays, people have had a longer time to be able to collect the money for, for paying fees. But I don't think that the situation is going to remain the same for a very long time. Things will def definitely normalize. So we are not going to implement what you are talking about immediately mm -hmm. when we are still in a, a crisis. We are aware of that. That's why we have even frozen the increment in fees. We have frozen it for two years, all hoping that after two years, the situation should be more or less back to normal. Okay. You are coming back from COVID-19 to start from wherever the, the, the situation has left you. How ready are you for what we normally hear in Makere? If it is not the lecturer, it's the staff, the, the, the support staff, striking payments, we want more money, we want this. If it's not the students, next month it will be the lecturers. Have you looked into all of that? Don't, shouldn't we expect closure of the university for some weeks after something like that has emerged? <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, the culture at the university has changed. First of all, I must say I thank the government because the government has been very supportive uh, through increasing the salaries of the members of staff. Uh, the salaries of staff at public universities in Uganda are among the best on the continent now. Uh, even, even, if, yes, even if no several of, of the categories have not been fully enhanced. Were these men right? to strike and complain those the days when it was not good? No, uh, at the beginning of these tensions, definitely I, I would say there was some justification because at that time the staff were just saying, give us at least a living wage because they thought they actually had no money to buy food or take children to school. So it was justified at that time and the, the government understood and came in and enhanced the salaries. Okay. Yes. So, so I don't really expect that we should have uh, a problem there, although, as I have said, not everybody has been fully enhanced. The, 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 the salaries they have are not the same they were having before. They are not as bad as salaries in the, what, what was there. So uh, the situation has drastically improved in that area. For, for the students, we have been telling them, you are the cream of society. You have you got your heads. If you have issues, Solve them through reasoning. You don't have to go around the, you know, rioting. It does not help anything. On several occasions, students try to talk to you, management, mm -hmm. and it is after you failing or refusing to listen to them that they choose to go to the streets of the university. That may be true and not true because uh, I think uh, uh, we made every effort and the uh, to talk to the students all the time. But the students have their politics, which is connected with the national politics, and the things just come out, and sometimes you ask them, so what are you writing about? And so some riots are backed by 
politics outside they the They are universe. engineered from outside the universe. Professor, you have facts to that? Yes. Like which one? No, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you are an investigating journalist. You go and find out whether what I'm telling you is not true. So most student strikes at Makerere are engineered from outside the university. Okay. But we have dealt with that also. And I think we have got medicine for it. Yes. During uh, the COVID-19 uh, challenge is when we saw our main building getting burnt. What went wrong? What happened? Yes, the main building Did is, it is an old building. Well, no, there are buildings which are very old. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but by our standards, it is an old building. It was completed in the 40s. And it was completed at a time during the war. And certain things were not done uh, as it should be. Uh, that's what we discovered later on, especially the wiring was not really done up to standard. And the, the investigation actually confirmed that uh, the fire uh, started from an electrical fault in the roof. And uh, that's what caused the fire. Uh, so uh, it was an accident. And uh, this fire was put out and it restarted again the next day. No, it wasn't restarted. <laughs> what happened is that uh, uh, because there was a lot of uh, paper, especially in the area where you say it was restarted, uh, the fire had basically been put out, but uh, uh, there was still smoldering, and probably everybody thought the fire had been put out. And maybe because of the intense heat, the paper again warmed up and uh, ignited. And that's why it, it restarted. It was really not that again another fire started somewhere. It was the same fire. That's what raised the, the, the suspicion among the public that that must be somebody. No, no. He saw that this one was put out, so he came back in the no, night. No, no, no. It was just that the fire which had been put out because of the heap of paper down there, the heat may have re reignited it again. But yes, it was an accident. And the, it was a, a very sad accident for, for all of us at Makera. For the historical building. Yeah. Are there plans to have this building, and how far? Yes, so uh, our plan is to reconstruct the building to look exactly the same as it, it was before. Of course, while modernizing the facilities, modernizing the interior, modernizing the firefighting systems, uh, modernizing the electrical wiring and the plumbing. It will be a modern building inside, but uh, outside it will maintain its uh, historical architectural outlook. Uh, we, uh, of course, uh, have said we will be appealing to alumni to contribute to uh, restoring everything that was destroyed through that fire. But we have been uh, uh, very lucky, and again, once again, I want to thank the government very much. The government has uh, agreed to fund the reconstruction of the building. We have already tendered out the works. A hundred percent? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, the building itself. But of course, there are other things inside the building. And for those who shall be going to our alumni and well wishers to see if they can support us to restore whatever was inside the building. Uh, so uh, we, we will be launching a fundraising drive on the 25th November, uh, which is uh, uh, connected to our celebrations of 100 years. So uh, on the 25th of November, we shall be holding that stakeholders meeting, and we will then be launching a fundraising drive. And I would like to appeal, use this opportunity to appeal to all our alumni. You are very many around the world, yes. and we want to appeal to you to come and support us, not just to, re to restore what was destroyed, or to even renovate all the other dilapidated buildings because there are other buildings which are in the same category as the many building, but also to support us in our new strategy of being a research-led university so that we can do very much research and uh, carry out innovations to help the economic development of our country. Let's talk about the 100 years celebration. What is there? How ready are you? What do we have to show? as that day comes, what is Makere going to show as its pride as she makes a hundred years? 
Yes, uh, the celebrations were officially launched by His Excellency the President on the 9th uh, October at the Independence uh, celebrations at Kololo by unveiling the logo of the 100 years. The, the celebrations are going to take one year. So the climax of the celebration will be in October next year. Uh, during that one year, we have a series of uh, activities, beginning with this uh, uh, fundraising launch that I'm talking about, at which we shall also inform our stakeholders on what uh, it is all about. There will be a series of activities, there will be conferences, there will be workshops, there will be publications to be made, uh, there will be events at uh, the original 18 districts of Uganda which contributed to the construction of the university. You should know it was, uh, the university was built by the whole country, by those districts contributing to the construction of the university. We will have uh, events at the parliament because this university belongs to the people of Uganda, so we shall have an event at the parliament. And uh, we hope to also hold events at uh, our former campus in Nairobi, which is now University of Nairobi, and Dar es Salaam, which is now our former campus. Yes, those were, those were former campuses of Makere University. They were, uh, at the beginning, they were part of Makere University? Yes. They were part of the University of East Africa, which uh, was Makere, yes. Okay. Uh, now, the, what do we have to show for the 100 years? We don't even need to talk about it. I know you know mm -hmm. the enormous, first of all, all the human resource for this country over the last 100 years. The top, the managers who manage the affairs of this country are all Makere alumni. All the doctors, all the engineers, all the lawyers, all the judges are Makere alumni. 90% of the parliament are Makere alumni. So you can go to any you sector. You're not talking about journalists. All the journalists, <laughs> they, are all, they are all Makere people, the yeah. teachers and so on. So uh, that is one thing, the human source for this country. Two, the liberation struggle, independence. Makere contributed greatly. You know that some of the uh, people who led these independence struggles were Makere people, Nyerere, Kivaki, Obote, and others. Edward Mutesa. Edward Mutesa was our student here. So Makere contributed to the independence struggles. But even after independence, all the advancements in the science, which you have been seeing, advancements in the medicine, in agriculture, in engineering, it has all been here. So we have a lot. About a former Katikiro who was killed because of giving out this land. Yes. Uh, Katikiro Nsivirwa. That's why we have a Nsivirwa hall here. He uh, was the one who took a decision to give the land to the colonial government to start a university. Now, when he did that, the Vataka thought that he was giving away their land mm -hmm. to the co colonial government, to the colonialists. Yes. And they thought it was betrayal. So they actually assassinated him. That is all history? Yes. Okay. So we are going to celebrate all that. Where, when, do we have a grand kind of ceremony uh, for, for, for that particular day or that particular Yes, the climax will be the grand uh, a sort of climax to the celebrations. And there we expect a major sort of conference where we expect the heads of the three East African states which own the Makere University, that is the, the presidents of Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, to, 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 to be there and uh, participate in those celebrations. We expect uh, some other prominent alumni to, to come and uh, speak at that event. We, we will have cultural galas by our students and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it will be a colorful ceremony. In a hundred years, you have been at universities beyond, outside Uganda. In a hundred years, what do you think Makerere is still lacking? What do you think Makerere has not yet done? Yes, uh, Makerere has done a lot, obviously. It could have done 
more. But remember, there was a period when uh, uh, life was very difficult. We lost a lot of our academia in the 70s. Uh, I think more than uh, more than 50, more than 60 percent of all our professors went into exile. Uh, and, the, and, the, and things were not easy. So when uh, eventually we got out of that period and we started settling down, we started rebuilding. And I'm personally amazed at how fast we have been able to rebuild and to take the university back to the world stage to be among the best universities. Yes, it, uh, it is just amazing. And I think it is the spirit of Makerere that made that possible. The people are part of this spirit and they take this personally. Professor, what do you think is that one thing that we have not yet held, no, we have not yet that. touched as Makerere in the 100 years, comparing with the universities you have seen elsewhere in the world? What we have not touched is what now we want to do. We have been doing research, uh, but we have been doing research mainly for publications, promotions, and so on. We have not been doing research to bring out innovations that create uh, a commercial, commercializable uh, you know, uh, goods that can then create companies and which can now employ people. That is what we have not done, and that is now part of our strategy. We have already started embarking on that. Okay. Now, there is a saga of land between you, Makerere University, and the community in Katanga. You want to evict them. And uh, your name is again in the news. <laughs> <laughs> for, for something like that. For something controversial. Thank you for asking that. Let me address this to my fellow Ugandans. And uh, let me tell you this. The United States is a powerful country because in the 1700s, the government took a decision to allocate land to, for universities in every state. And those universities are called state universities. So you have Michigan State University, you have uh, New York State University, you have got it, uh, Texas and so on. It is those universities which are responsible for the powerful United States we now see. Here, people even shed their blood for this university. You have just mentioned the Katikiro in Sibiru. He was killed because of giving this land. He was seeing far. Some people didn't see that far. Apart from Sibiru giving the land, even the colonial government gave us land, including the land in Katanga. The colonial government bought that land from Obataka and gave it to Makerere University. For what? Wasn't this enough? This campus is very small compared to the campuses I'm telling you in the United States, which are on square miles of land. Mm -hmm. First, tell us where the problem now is coming from. The problem is because of the problems we have gone through as a country and so on, people started slowly settling on our land in Katanga. And they manage even to create titles on top of our own title. That issue was resolved in the court, and the part of the land where the people are settled was, has not been settled completely. And the last ruling, I think in 2015, was that the land belongs to Makerere. But the people who are there are bona fide occupants. And you know what that means in law. Yes. It means if we want them to go, we have to compensate okay. them and all that. We give them first opportunity and so on. There is, however, another part of the land which had already been cleared in 1997, including by the Court of Appeal. That has never changed. So the land which people are talking about, although they are trying to deceive the public, where we want to de put some developments is that land which is free of encumbrances where there were no uh, squatters and so on. That land was cleared and cleared even by the Court of Appeal. We appealed 
for the other part of the land they were appealed that decision that the land that those people are bona fide. occupants. Because for us, we think by 1995, they were not there. We know they were not in 19. That's why we are appealing. So when people say this matter is in the court, they are confusing the public. We have no issue with the people staying in Katanga for the land where the judge said they are bona fide. Let them stay there until court decides otherwise. And we cannot even touch them. But this land which was cleared where we want to do our development is free. And the land grabbers who are trying to grab it are confusing the public by claiming that we want to get rid of the people in Katanga. We have no problem with the people in Katanga. We have a problem with land grabbers who want to steal public land in the open. And there are people on that land? No. But somebody came and started building there overnight and that's the battle we have now. So I want to make that absolutely clear. We have no problem with the people in Katanga because that is still a court issue on the, on the part where people are settled, we have no problem. On the part where there are no people settled, that was cleared way back in 1997. We are free to develop there. And the land grabbers who are coming and trying to grab the land in daylight, trying to use the people in the Katanga, confusing them, saying we want to chase them, are very selfish. They don't have the interests of this country in their heart. Okay. We, 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 will you win that battle as Makere because land has become some serious thing in this country? I just want to warn people that you cannot fight Makere. You will lose. We have all the documentation. The people saying their land, they don't even have a title. We have all the title. What do you want to do on that land? I have told you we want to begin now things like Science Park. We, have got, we want to specialize in the areas where we are, we are searching. We have a land institute, we have no land where to put it, it could go there. We have tried several times, we had even wanted to begin the Hatti Institute there. There were still these land grabbers disturbing us. We want to begin a science and technology park where our young people who have got good ideas can go there after the, and develop those ideas into commercial products. Uh, Young innovators from outside the country, all these other people who may, even if they have not come to the university, who have got good ideas, can come back, can come to that facility. Their exactly. Mm -hmm. They get assistance from our professors, get some guidance, and develop their products until they can commercialize them. So, what we want to do there is extremely important for the nation. Okay. Let me talk about the university hospital. Have you people developed that place? Our small university hospital? Yes. Thank you. you I would like needs. to encourage you to go there. You were here when it was there. Yes. And you know what it was. You go there now and see what the difference it is. <laughs> <laughs> you, will, you will be shocked. You will what wonder. is the difference there? Can it now accommodate over 15 patients? No. Uh, the issue is not the number of people it can accommodate, but the quality. But this is a community with a big population. Yes. The quality of the service they can render. We are building the theater for the first time. We want to, we are, we are building there an ICU unit. Those were not there before. Uh, but apart from that, we have put there a lot of uh, modern equipment for diagnostics of different diseases. It is a completely different place. What we want now to embark on is the expansion that we are talking about so that we can have more uh, patients there. The ultimate aim for us is to have a teaching and research university. And we have land on which we want to do that, but that is an expensive venture. We have appealed to the private sector, we have appealed to government, and the efforts are being made by government to uh, identify resources for us to put up a teaching and research uh, hospital. But our small hospital, has now been modernized. Th th that reminds me, many universities had challenges mm -hmm. with uh, instructions that whoever enters here for classes must have been vaccinated. What is the case in Makere? No, we are not insisting on that since by the time the students were allowed to come back, the vaccination process was still going on. Mm -hmm. uh, we could not uh, stop the students. We are just putting in place measures to ensure that uh, we minimize the possibility of the spread of uh, the COVID-19. 
However, we have also appealed to the means of uh, health to make special arrangements for us to be able to vaccinate the students at our hospital and also here on campus. And we are waiting for that. Thank you so much, Professor. The, by the time you came into office, there was a lot of... Makerere was so much in the news. And the name now was so much in every headline, in every article. You, you were talked about as a very high-handed man. You were suspending people and expelling people and things like that. How did that end? Is it COVID-19 that has silenced things and because being that you're back now to work, are we going to have your face and name in the news again? I have never been high-handed. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been high-handed. I've just been focused. My focus is we Africans must know what we want. If we want to develop, we are not going to develop through riots, through demonstrations, through destroying property. And I'm saying, let us be a modern university like any other modern university, which is doing research and contributing to the development of their countries. But you, you, you agreed with me that be, with the increment of the payments now, the men and women here were right. Their strikes were justifiable. No, no, really, but... Uh, there but, was really need to increase their pay. Yes, but, but you don't have to riot. When the increments were done, nobody was on riot. Nobody was on strike. When we were busy going on a strike, nobody was increasing. When we settled, then it was increased. And I would like to believe that I contributed to that, <laughs> bringing in place that situation where people concentrate on what brought them. You suspended people here. Why? I was not the first vice chancellor. I actually have suspended much fewer people than all my predecessors. But because it was being captured by you people in the press, <laughs> I don't know why you people got so much interested in my career when I became the vice chancellor, that you started publishing everything. My predecessors suspended and dismissed people. I have not dismissed a single person. But people have been dismissed before. People have been suspended in large numbers than I ever suspended. But uh, actually, what, what, what we used to hear is that you, you suspended those you, you thought were not in support of your being in office and things like that. No, the, the people I was suspending I don't come anywhere near to deciding who the vice chancellor <laughs> will be. They don't even participate in that. So I, this, but you, you said you're not high-handed. Would that, wouldn't that be the last decision to take? Which one? You're suspending people than talking to them and create calmness and things like that. By the way, I talk a lot to people. If I decide to suspend, it means I have talked and talked and the talking is not helping. But some decision must be made to ensure that the university moves forward. There were even vows that were taken, we shall make sure he is not in that office and things like that. <laughs> By who? <laughs> <You're calling me. laughs> well, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here and uh, uh, it is not surprising that some people are vowing, but uh, I think... Uh, you have not heard of them? You have not heard of I have, I have heard, of oh, course. I thought I, I was saying something strange. I, no, no, no. I have heard. I have, uh, I have seen uh, letters, uh, uh, doshas written about me to different kinds of authorities, how I'm a dictator and all that. And uh, I am aware of all that. Have you had people calling you a dictator? Ah, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about it? When you look at the way you work, your predecessors and how other people do things, then you look at how you work. What do you think about it? Well, I, I, I don't know uh, the definition of a dictator. A dictator is one who takes all decisions on his own. I don't make any decisions. The decisions in this universe are made by council. I only implement those decisions. So how can I be a dictator when I'm implementing decisions made by a council? You influence the decisions. How do I influence those decisions? The council is made up of 25 people. I'm just one. No, no. Uh, well, the, the bottom line is what I told you, that uh, uh, my mission was to stabilize the university so that it can meaningfully contribute to the development of the country. That I will do <coughs> through thick and thin. 
You said people have written dossiers about you. Yeah, I've seen some of them. Some of them have leaked. How again do they end to you? Maybe they're just threatening you. No, well, I don't know, uh, but uh, I see them and, uh, you know, in this country, it's not very... Where do they take them? <laughs> You're a journalist and I'm sure you know. <laughs> you are the people who, <laughs> who reveal these things. So you know where the people write to. <laughs> yes. but, uh, anyway, so c c can that lead to y your downfall or anything like that? No, my, I, I believe that uh, my downfall is if I stop doing the right thing. Okay. As long as I'm doing the right thing, you can write as much you want. But as long as I'm doing the right thing, I believe the appointing authority knows what I'm doing. And if they think I'm not doing the right thing, they will do what is necessary. I believe at the moment I'm doing the right thing. I'm trying to stabilize the university. I'm trying to put the university on the right course for the 21st century, for our country to enter the 21st century properly. As in, in stabilizing this, the university, as we wind up, Professor, yeah. what stumbling blocks have you met on the way? Oh, well, you, some of them you are saying, you know, where people think, uh, you know, people, uh, this university is full of PhDs. Mm -hmm. Everybody is highly educated and they, they want to reason a lot. And do they want or they do? They do. Okay. And uh, everybody, I think, thinks that uh, their opinion or their position is the right one. I think that's part of the problem. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, it, is, it is good that people have that kind of independence and the, the reason that and so on. But, but the problem has not really come from the people who want to reason. The problem has come from people who are bent on destabilizing things for reasons that I don't know. And uh, it is those that I have been trying to, to, to calm down. I think I have calmed them down. How about the politics? The, the people that you were competing with for office, could they be the ones no, 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 running no. after you in different no, ways? No, no, no. We don't have any evidence that uh, the people I competed with could be trying to destabilize me. How are you working with them? Quite well. Some of them are still in the university. Others left the university and, they, and I meet them and we chat and uh, there, is no, there, is no, there is no trace of any... Uh, destabilization that is emanating from these good gentlemen. They were all men. So colleague PH holders are warming up for you. <laughs> warming up to do what? <laughs> to, call, to, to how to compete you the next time the, the job is... Oh yeah, and the, that is welcome. That is, I mean, uh, we are all intellectuals. Uh, as you, you, you do your work, do you think about that time? No, I, I, I signed the contract to do certain things. My concentration is on that. Beyond that, we shall see what comes. But for now, I just want to make sure that I move this university to a level uh, to where I expected it to take or even higher. That's where my concentration is. Thank you so much, Professor. His name is Professor Barnabas Dawangwe. He is the Vice Chancellor, Makerere University. Your Vice Chancellor number what? 11. He's the 11th Vice Chancellor of this beautiful, biggest university in the beautiful part of Africa, Uganda. He says he's here to stabilize Makerere University. We had a very good chat. Thank you so much for being part of it as a viewer. My name is Michael Jordan Nukomwa. I'm with Davis Kamukama, the man in charge of the pictures you see. We wish you <laughs>